Coming up in the news, terminations in Grand Bahamas industrial sector. Residents of Abaco sounding off about difficulty in accessing building materials. And a 22-year-old arraigned on the charge of murder. The Bahamas Tonight, the Northern Edition, starts now. This is the Bahamas Tonight, Northern Edition. Bahamas tonight, the Northern Edition. Good evening, all. I'm Megan Shepard. Thank you so much for tuning in. Topping news, more Grand Bahamians joining the unemployment line. ZNS News has learned that 11 employees of Palmas International received letters of termination at the end of last week. Those impacted are said to be 10 members of the line staff and one manager. The terminations are said to be linked to the growing worldwide ban on single-use plastic. Polymers produces polystyrene beads that are used to make styrofoam products like styrofoam food containers, cups, and other plastic items. But reports say that due to the growing worldwide ban on single-use plastics, there has been a reduction in demand for the beads, the raw product produced at the plant here in Freeport. The ban on single-use plastic and styrofoam that took effect here in the Bahamas on January 1st has been adopted by many countries around the world. Meantime, reports say no further layoffs are expected at the Polymers plant in the near future. Two town hall meetings held over the weekend on the island of Abaco. On Friday evening, the Disaster Reconstruction Authority met with the business community, followed by residents of Treasure Key. And as we hear in this report, the concerns expressed were rather similar. Entrepreneurs on the island of Abaco expressing their eagerness to restart their businesses. However, they note that they have been encountering some challenges, including having access to material on island. Another necessity in the rebuilding process, funding. Senior advisor in the Small Business Development Center, Winston Roll. That I know one of the challenges that we've had is persons feel that, why do I have to provide any past information if you know I've lost everything? I know it's a challenge, but why it's necessary is because in many instances, what we have been finding, and not necessarily in Abaco, but all around, uh, even, in, even in New Providence, businesses that come to us for funding um, are barely limping along themselves. And so our job is not just to assist with financing, but to also work with development. So it's no use for us to help you get funding to a business that was already struggling. Our job is to also try and help you so that we can make sure that once you get this funding, this business can be sustainable and continue to grow. And so we do have to get some of that historical information to know at least where you were so that we can get you back there and beyond. He explains how the funding will be provided. Initially, there was a $30,000 grant that was in our purview. Since then, we've gotten the government to increase that to $50,000. Okay. Um, then there's loans that we then can facilitate. We can facilitate what is considered a microloan, and the microloans go up to $15,000. But what we can do with a microloan is we can marry that with a, with a grant that we um, have under our purview so that you can get a $30,000 amount of money with 15 grant, 15 loan. And the microloans are such that we structure them um, at extremely comfortable interest rates over long periods of time. So um, you're talking a $200 a month type payment arrangement. In Treasure Key, Managing Director of the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, Kay Smith, outlines the qualifications for the Small Home Repair Program. First of all, you have to be a citizen of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. You have to, have own, you have to own your property. Um, you have to have lived at the damaged property on August 31st and that can be confirmed by a utility bill or some other acceptable verification. You, if you have insurance, you cannot access this program. The property obviously must be located in Grand Bahama or Abaco and the Keys. The assistance you get can be for labor only, material only, or a combination of both. Um, the tradesmen and subcontractors must be approved by the Disaster Reconstruction Authority the Ministry of Works or the Grand Bahama Port Authority if, we, if you have a house in Freeport. And only authorized vendors um, that we, that's on our list 
we will be using. And again, I repeat, we are using local vendors only. Residents there say they are eager to rebuild their community, but expressing concerns over building code adjustments and permits necessary to begin work. Administrator Therese Buda Lang says that the town planning department may still have home building plans submitted within the last 10 years, and that if persons are seeking to rebuild, they are encouraged to visit the relevant offices. If we're able to retrieve them and there was no damage to them, persons have come to us to request a plan, the, a copy of their plans, and we've been facilitating that. Now, Ministry of Works can speak better to the issue of waiver because we have not been directed to waiver building permit fees because if you are reconstructing a house that has been totally destroyed and you resubmit your plan, there is a permit number that has to be assigned to that new structure and we're not authorized as yet to waiver the permit fee. Residents of East End also having their say at a town hall meeting. Residents were not holding back as they took issue with a number of matters related to the restoration and recovery effort. Our Jamila Mizik reports. For all over Grand Bahama. Residents in the East End constituency sounding off at a town hall meeting spearheaded by the Bahamas Disaster Reconstruction Authority. Relevant agencies present heard the concerns of residents, many of them not too happy about the level of recovery in their area. This resident, Andrea Thompson, attacking the Grand Bahama Utility Company for what she feels was a lack of preparation. You did not have spare mechanisms here, spare parts prayer, whatever to go in, knowing that hurricane season is upon us and knowing that that was not the first rodeo out there. You guys have really let us down. All of your generators, your standby equipment, all of that went underwater, okay? You can't do anything about that. Those, those equipment, when they go underwater, you cannot operate those equipment. Even when that water recedes, we have to do a lot of work to get those equipment back so that we can begin an operation. Meantime, the Smiths Point resident Valerie Eden is adamant that no one has visited her home since the storm and she's seeking what she feels is a much needed home assessment. I was told on numerous occasions everywhere I go that Smith Point was not damaged. In my home alone, Okay, well, three inches of water. Right now, all my ceiling is down from the rain that, that the roof is leaking. And I reported it. And to be honest with you, nobody came out there from the government entities to even check our homes. Ministry of Works that does not have enough people to, to do assessments on the ground. So in Smith's Point, I will make you a promise next week, I can have somebody come to Smith's Point, go through the neighborhood, and look at those homes that have not been assessed. I think Smith's Point knows that people have been to their house. On the other hand, this Queens Cove resident, Charles Bellard, is wondering what plans are in place for the future prevention or at least minimization of storm surge in the flood-prone community. They understand that Dorian was an exceptional storm and that regardless of where it hit, you would have had storm surge. So I'm not talking about Dorian by itself, but being in Queens Cove for almost 20 years, I've seen that just any strong north wind can start a storm surge in Queens Cove that results in Queens Highway being flooded um, and then Chesapeake being flooded. All the flooding starts in Queens Cove because there's no natural water flow due to blockage in the harbor area. One of the things that the authority is trying to do, and you'll see it more in our educational programs that's coming up, um, a lot of people who want to help the Bahamas in terms of do donors would prefer if we start to look at building back better and building with some level of resiliency. And so to answer your question, the authority has a technical team that is looking at and, and trying to do some research on areas like Quinn's Cove, Sweeting's Key, and all of the coastal communities in Grand Bahama, Abaco, and the Keys. That's a separate discussion. Between my now chief counselor and my MP, 
where does the hierarchy, where does East Grand Bahama start from? Because it seems like every time there's something happening for East Grand Bahama, Maida Town, Smith Point, and Waterkey is left out. Now tell me where to start from and where to end. The East Grand Bahama constituency starts from Coral Road and goes all the way back to Sweden's Key, including Waterkey. Um, the, the issues in respect to Maida Town are not ignored. So if, and, and I do know that people were in the area. Now, if there's a, is, yeah. if there's a specific um, request, certainly we can talk um, and see how we can help. Jamila Mizik, ZNS Network News. Now at that town hall meeting, Managing Director of the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, Kay Smith, announced the launch of the Small Homes Repair Program. Tonight, she's clearing the air about some misinformation regarding the initiative. Smith says the website to register for the program will go live on February 10th, and the application process is only available online. She adds that the offices designated for small home assistance will be operated by appointment only. I think it's very important for people to understand the process for applying for the assistance. First of all, we do not want to encourage the public to come out to the offices because we are not in a position to accommodate long lines of people. And we don't want to frustrate the public, so we're asking the public to work with us. We want all persons to register online once the program goes live on February 10th. That's the first thing. We also recognize that there are some people, whether in Grand Bahama, whether in Abaco, may not have the opportunity to use the internet, um, may, not, may have some difficulty navigating the online registration portal, which is going to be a very simple process. However, if there are persons who feel they have some difficulty, we're asking them to call the hotline. Our call center people will be able to instruct them over the phone, or we can make an appointment for those persons to come in and get the assistance they need. Once again, the program will be officially launched on February 10th, and the number for the program's hotline will be made known to the public on that same day. In other news, police taking a suspect before the court today to be charged in connection with that fatal shooting in the Garden Villas area last week. 22-year-old Alex Darricard of Lewis Yard was arraigned before Deputy Chief Magistrate Debbie Ferguson for the murder of 25-year-old Dario Pinder. Darricard was not required to enter a plea, bail was denied, and the matter is set to resume with a trial on May 11th. Darricard was remanded to custody until that time. And as we said earlier, the charges stem from a fatal shooting last Tuesday in Garden Villas. Police say they received reports of gunshots in that area. Officers responded and met Pinder lying on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds about the body. He was taken to hospital by ambulance where he later died. Pinder's death is classified as the first murder for the year. Two men hauled before the court today and according to police, they are accused of stealing furniture from homes in East and Grand Bahama. Valerian Burroughs, age 45, of Trumpeter Drive in Arden Forest, and Theodore Martin, 43, of Freeport, were both arraigned on the charge of unlawful possession and vagrancy. They both pled not guilty and were granted bail in the amount of $1,800 with one surety. The matter was adjourned to March 9th. Additionally, Martin was also arraigned for possession of dangerous drugs. He pled not guilty and was granted bail in the amount of $900 with one surety. That case was adjourned to March 9th as well. All of these matters are in connection with complaints from residents in East Grand Bahama. And also from the court tonight, Clinton Lang, seen on your screen in the black jacket and purple shirt, appearing in court today on the charge of unlawful possession and possession of dangerous drugs. Lang, age 29, a resident of Barkatine Drive, was arraigned before Magistrate Charlton Smith. He pled not guilty to unlawful possession of a large quantity of copper wire. He was granted cash bail in the amount of $1,000, and the matter was adjourned to March 17th for trial. On the dangerous drugs charge, Lang pled guilty and was fined $300 or one month behind bars. means it is the month of love. We're coming to you live from the Port Lakaya Marketplace and we're going to find out what specials are in place for you to take advantage of during this season of love. 
Don't go away. All that and more when we come back. <laughs> 